Hi, this is Emre Sargan. I lead the trust and safety detection engineering teams at YouTube. Today, I'll be giving an overview on how we use machine learning algorithms for trust and safety. 500 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute, uploaded from every country in the world 24 hours a day. Most of that content informs, inspires, or simply delights our viewers and represents our rich and diverse community. However, there is a small fraction of content that sometimes cross the line. How does YouTube manage such harmful content? We handle harmful content based on four R's principle. Remove, reduce, raise, and reward. We remove content that violates our community guidelines. We reduce the spread of misinformation that may potentially be harmful to society. We raise the content from authoritative sources. We reward the trusted creators and partners. In today's talk, I'll focus on the remove category. So let's start with some numbers. In Q4 of 2021, we removed 3.75 million videos due to community guideline violations. You can see the breakdown of removed content by community guideline vertical on the right. Largest violations in terms of video volume happen in the child safety vertical, followed by graphic violence and adult. About 92% of these removals were detected through automated flagging by our algorithms. On the tech side, we removed 1.26 billion comments in Q4 of 2021 due to community guideline violations. You can see the breakdown of removed content by community guideline vertical on the right. Largest violations in terms of comment volume happen in the spam vertical, followed by harassment and child safety. In the text case, more than 99% of these removals were detected through automated flagging by our algorithms. Now, how do we use machine learning systems? We use a combination of advanced machine learning systems and our community itself to flag content that they think may violate our policies, and our expert reviewers remove the content does indeed violate our policies. Machine learning has been a game changer when it comes to proactively identifying harmful content at the type of scale we see on YouTube. In a nutshell, machine learning is a way to teach computers what we want to find by showing them the examples of what we are looking for. Machines are then able to take these examples work out patterns that explain them, then use those patterns to make predictions about new examples that find things that match. We automatically remove the content where the match confidence is high and flag the rest for human review. Content reviewers then evaluate the flag content whether or not they violate any of the community guidelines. The ones that violate our policies are removed and the rest are kept on platform. These decisions are then fed back to machine to improve the accuracy of future decisions. And the cycle goes on. So building and deploying machine learning systems for trust and safety at scale has unique sets of challenges. Understanding and representing the context for entities like videos, comments, posts, etc., is extremely challenging. Entities often define as a bundle of multiple modalities, video, image, text, hyperlinks, etc. Multimodal models are particularly useful to capture the interactions between multiple modalities. More on that later. The next item is that the policies can be quite complex and often come with exceptions, such as educational and public interest. We believe that capturing and feeding the factors 
like subcomponents of a policy decision to the machine as a prediction task helps to disambiguate these complex policies. The next one is that many policies are around what's being said, which require complex language understanding. For example, understanding the difference between hate speech at a rally and news reporting on the same event is very difficult. Luckily, researchers at Google have developed cutting edge computational language models, which are extremely critical to achieve language understanding. I'll cover that later in the deck. Moving on, the content on our platform constantly evolves. So does our policies to address new trends. Version labels and using time of decision as a feature in our models help to model for such change and shifts in the policy. Measuring success is another big challenge. It's essentially equivalent to counting an unknown number of needles in a haystack. Statistical sampling techniques come in help to reduce the uncertainty in the measurement without requiring a prohibitively large number of human reviews. Last but not least, adversarial actors use various circumvention and coordination tactics to evade our detection algorithms. Focusing on the intent at the channel level to detect circumvention or dedication yields more mileage rather than detecting individual videos, which ends up being a whack-a-mole game. Now let's take a look at multimodal content classification. As you can see, a video is composed of multiple signals. That includes audio, video, speech, OCR, metadata, logos, and the list goes on. These signals are then fed to modular blocks that transform them into a canonical vector format so that they are concatenated and fed to the rest of the network which produces the final risk assessment. Training the blocks jointly is the best practice in theory, but in reality, there are a few factors which makes it less effective. The first one is that the end goal specific training data, in our case, it's predicting the probability of video being violative or not, is often very scarce. And joint training requires a lot of training data to learn the interactions between these components. The second one is to address the first one, adding more auxiliary tasks to make training more robust may impact overall performance. The model may get confused on how to distinguish between the importance of the auxiliary tasks and the, the main one. The third one is the larger models are harder to iterate on. Using modular blocks is crucial for developer velocity because it allows for parallel development and each modular block can be trained or updated separately. Not being able to jointly train is a drawback, but so far we still believe that it's a better trade-off. The video module can be the one which is trained to predict video-to-video -video similarity and pseudo-labels. The goal of this module is to make sure that the pixels and audio track is transformed into a space where similar videos are mapped close to each other and dissimilar ones are mapped far away from each other. And pseudo labels are used so that the videos that share the same pseudo labels are mapped close to each other. Video representation is one of the most computationally complex operations since it involves processing the pixels. Modularization of this component is critical because it often requires pre-computing the output of this module and saving it for future uses. Now let's move to the text module. The text module can be the text-to-text -text transfer transformer, which is referred to as T5, which is one of the latest text models coming from Google Research. It is trained to predict multiple tasks, included but not limited to translation, sentence acceptability, 
sentence similarity, and sentence summary. It's important to note that the policy violation can happen in a very short subsegment of the video. Therefore, both video and text representations can be extracted on sliding segments to be able to better localize the policy violation. Localization not only helps the model to be more effective, but also can be used to assist the human reviewer to verify the presence of a violation in that very short segment. Moving to the speech module. The speech module takes the speech waveform as input and it applies the automated speech recognition module to get the plain text. Plain text is then passed to the text module to get the segment level speech rec representation. It's worth noting that we generally find it quite useful to combine the segment level speech representation with raw plain text tokens in final representation. This can help the model focus on certain words when needed, which may not be as easy to do when with the pre-trained text module. Okay, so far what we have talked about the systems to detect policy violative entities. The reality is that the vast majority of our creators never break our community guidelines. However, for the ones who upload a video that violated one of our policies, we notify the creator to let them know what we have done and why we have done it. First time, they may just receive a warning, but after that, they could get a community guideline strike as well as restrictions placed on their channel, such as not being able to upload videos, live streams, or stories for at least a week. Three strikes in 90 days and you're out. It's worth noting that when a violation is egregious, such as uploading content that sexualizes children, we may skip the strike system and remove the account altogether at once. From our earliest days, we've relied on three strike system since it gives everyone a chance to review and understand what went wrong before they face more severe consequences. And it works. 94% of those who receive a first strike never get a second one. However, as we discussed before, adversarial actors are known to deploy circumvention and coordination tactics to evade our detection systems. I'll cover more on that in the next slide. It's worth, it's worth noting that, as with any system, we sometimes make mistakes and remove a video we shouldn't remove. Like when a reviewer reviewed a video for what they thought was a violation of misinformation policy, but it turned out to be a parody video that was apparent to most users. So when we notify creators that their videos are removed for policy violations, they receive a link to appeal our decision. If they appeal, we'll review the case again, and then the decision is either upheld or reversed. Now, going back to the adversarial actors, it's important to have a system that can understand relationships between creators to be able to detect the ones who are trying to evade detection algorithms through circumvention and coordination. One of the approaches is to be building a semi-supervised graph where the goal is to predict the probability that a pair of creators who share an edge are both policy violative. On the left, there's a toy example where the edges that connect clicky nodes have a high probability of being violative. And on the right are some examples from real graphs where red dots represent violative creators and the green ones represent the non-violative ones. The algorithm can effectively detect violative creators in both sparsely and densely connected networks, as well as the ones that are intermixed with non-violative creators. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. I'm looking forward to have the Q&A session with you all soon. Thank you.